Good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to be with you this afternoon. There's a lot of noise going on, so can I check? Can you hear me? Sounds good? Okay. Um, I'm going to start off by just saying to you, when I talk, I usually, and particularly when I'm talking about women in leadership, I get very excited. So if I start talking too fast, can you just wave at me so I know to slow down? Because right now I can't hear myself with all the other noise going on. Okay, great. Um, I'm really pleased to be here today. It's a fantastic event, and I hope you found it really useful and interesting, the talks, the exhibitions that are going on. And I'm absolutely thrilled to be here today talking about a lot of programs Henley are doing, but in particular, a, a really fantastic new program that we're launching. Those of you who may not know who we are, Henley Business School has a strong tradition of delivering leadership programs. And I'm really pleased, proud to tell you that the leadership programs we deliver at Henley are grounded in really strong research and very, very applied thinking. And I have the privilege of teaching across a number of programs across Henley, and I can tell you that learning goes straight back into teams, back into organizations, and we get clients and students continuous, continuously telling us how affecting the, effective their learning is. We also have a truly international footfall. Can I just check, are any of you Henley alums here today? Okay, so I guess our Henley alums are actually out there helping to spread the word because we know a number of you have already come to visit us today. So just in case you're wondering, what does Henley do? I've explained to you our, our training programs, but here's the other thing, and it's always good to, to, to big yourself up, right? We tell women they have to big themselves up, so Henley's gonna do the same thing. We are top 25 worldwide in the UK for executive education, and we are top three in, sorry, top 25 internationally for executive education, and we are top three in the UK for open programs. So we really know what we're doing. And uh, my colleagues, some of my colleagues are here. The rest of my colleagues are at stand H65, so please come and speak to us. Now, I was asked to come here today and to talk to you about women in leadership. And you're all here and making time for this session because you recognize it's a really important area. I feel really privileged. This is what I get to do my work in every single day. I do lots of research in this space, and I'm working within, uh, within uh, well, with my colleagues in Exec Ed to create programs that really speak to how we support organizations to be more effective in recruiting, retaining, and promoting women into leadership positions. Now, provocatively, my title is Women in Leadership, Why It Still Matters. How many of you within your organizations deal within the diversity and inclusion piece, within women, that sort of area? Just let me see a show of hands. Okay. How many of you every so often get the eyes rolling going, oh God, not that topic again? Yeah, we know how that feels, okay? But here's the thing, it still matters. And I'm gonna share with you, some of you will know these stats, but I'm hoping that bringing them together, we really start to understand what's going on within this area. So I describe myself, I should have introduced myself to you. I'm Dr. Shahina Janjuha Jivraj. I'm an associate professor at Henley Business School. I actually really like to describe myself as a dysfunctional academic. And that means I love data. I'm a real geek when it comes to data. But do you know why I'm dysfunctional? Because I actually like getting out and talking to people like you. And actually taking the knowledge and the thinking that you have and shaping it into frameworks that we can use back in the classroom and that learning back from the classroom into organizations with you. So I'm certainly not one of those academics who likes to sit in a dusty cupboard and write research papers, although that's also very important. So why are we still talking about women in leadership? Well, I wanted to share some stats. And the first set of stats actually I'm looking at are women in the tech sector. So again, can I just ask how many of you are working within the tech sector? Okay, great. So I'm expecting great things from you in terms of questions. Um, right. In the UK, what proportion of tech firms have at least one woman on their boards? So I'm going to be really old school. We're going to raise our hands rather than using something funky like mobile technology. Have a look at that. And I'm just going to ask you to raise your hands if you think it's answer A, 0 to 10%. OK, so it's about a third of you. B, 11 to 
it's about a third. C, 21 to 30%. Okay, 30% or more. Okay, so the answer actually is B, 19%. So 19% of tech firms in the UK have at least one woman on their board. How do we feel about that stat? Good? Bad? Could be better? Do we give it an A, B, or a C? Grading. Sits a little bit uncomfortably, right? But let's look at what's going on within the tech sector. I've got some other stats here. And again, those of you who are in the tech sector, you might know what these stats refer to. I recognize it's going to be a bit hard for me to hear you, but let's try this. 17%, does anybody have any idea what that refers to? Okay. 17% of people working in the UK tech sector are women. Now, when you think back to the previous slide, then that 20% isn't too bad. Women are actually starting to punch above their, uh, their weight. But that's still a pretty shocking statistic, right? Any idea what the 20% refers to? So I said to you it's 19%, it's 19.xx%, so you rounded up, it's 20%. The number of women on tech boards has remained stagnant over the last 20 years. So I'm going to be really tough on those of us who are working in the DNI space, because here's the thing, the work that's being done, at best, it's kept us stagnant, but what it hasn't done is improve those numbers. It certainly hasn't dropped, and that's a good news story, but it hasn't progressed. And I just want you to think about that. Because if you think about all the activity that's going on, all the events, all the initiatives, and yet we've remained stagnant just within the tech sector. 7%. Anybody want to hazard a guess? Okay, this for me, I'm gonna give you a health warning. This is the most depressing stat for me, I have to say. Oh, sorry. Out of the students who are taking computer science A-level, only 7% are female. Only 7% are female. And of that 7%, only half of them will go into a related job. So you start thinking about your pipeline. It's terrifying. It's really, really worrying. We are working so hard to stand still, and yet that pipeline coming forward is actually narrowing. And so if we fast forward to five years, 10 years, these numbers should be lower because it's good. there just isn't the supply there. So bring thoughts. Now, I guess those of you in tech, you're, you're aware of these. But when you start to bring it all together, it actually really, really gets us to focus on what's happening in terms of recruiting but also what's happening within organizations. What are we doing to ensure that we're getting enough women to stay, ensuring that they actually progress into senior leadership roles? What organizations are doing to make, these, to make themselves culturally more open and flexible for women? But equally importantly, what do we need to do to focus on women? So that's the tech sector. Let's just scale out a bit because not all of you are from the tech sector. So let's see what's going on elsewhere as well. Now, these will be stats that, again, a number of you are quite familiar with. Towards the end of last year, the number of FTSE 100 companies managed to get to 30% of its board positions being held by women. Pretty good going, right? It's only taken 10 years to get there. Not so good when you think about that. Of course, there's a huge amount of work being done in this area. The 30% Club are phenomenal advocates working in this area. Their campaign started around 10 years ago, but that pushing has been constant. And we're really proud. We work with the 30% Club in sponsoring full-time MBAs for women. Uh, so it is something that we, we recognize as being a very important piece of what we do within Henley as well. When you look at uh, FTSE 250 and then the FTSE 350, we're about the middle 20%. Now, as I said, the numbers are okay but the rate of progress is really, really slow, and it's problematic. And in fact, uh, speaking to the co-chair of the 30% Club, one of the ways that they had to get the numbers really pushed up for the FTSE 250, it wasn't 
by encouraging companies because that sense of this is the right thing to do, this is the nice thing to do, it doesn't get the movement as quickly as the fear of peer pressure. And again, those of you might be aware of the work the 30% Club are doing, what they actually had to do was get, they actually took out a big advert around January last year in the Sunday Times where they were highlighting companies who hadn't signed up to their charter to get more women on boards. So again, it goes from, this is the right thing to do, here's the business case, we know, we know what the business case is, we understand the relationship between diversity and innovation, diversity and business performance, business is being more robust during the recession, there is so much research that speaks to this. And here's the irony, if we were saying to a company, if you implemented this in terms of a sales force and your uplift would be 11, 12, 14%, whatever the various figures show us, companies would be snapping at your fingers for that. But when it comes to talking about changing the workforce, because it's complicated, progress becomes so much slower. And actually, it's got to the point where we're having to threaten companies and say, if you don't do this, we will identify you as a company that's not performing. And therefore, you are not seen as a company of choice for amazing female talent that's out there. And in case you're thinking, and I'm sure you're not, but in case you're thinking, well, now we've got the momentum going, it's going to keep going. Categorically, I can tell you it doesn't happen that way. We have to keep pushing at every point. The research I do within Henley doesn't just cover the UK, it covers 52 countries globally. And I'll give you an example. We did some research looking at Nigeria. Now, Nigeria over the last three years, two years, sorry, the number of women at board level has dropped. It's plummeted by 30%. How on earth? can you lose 30% of board positions that were held by women? Because no matter how strong and robust the environment is, if you don't have the right mechanisms in place, if you don't have the pipeline in place, and if you don't have a commitment to it across the whole country, and that means within organizations, sectors, and, and at government level, it's so easy for this to drop. And I can share a lot more data with you. I've got some great reports on this. But the point is, that every inch you make as organizations becomes absolutely crucial, but it's keeping that pressure going. And for me, I started off by telling you why I love data. It's because of this. Because you pick up, on any day you go onto LinkedIn, you go onto social media, there will be so many events going on around the DNI space. And from an outsider's perspective, it looks like there's a lot of good work going on. And there is, there's a huge amount going on. But when you start looking at the figures, the question is actually, what progress are we making? What difference are we making? Now, here are the things. We recognize that there are lots of things that can go on within organizations. There's a huge amount that needs to be done. At the same time, there's also a lot that needs to focus on with women as well. And again, I'm going to bust some myths here. And again, I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with these and things that these are things you hear on a regular basis. So often, when we talk to organizations and they're, they're playing with the idea of investing in programs for women, these are some of the things we still hear. And again, I'm sure, judging by some of your faces, these are comments you hear as well when we are talking about women. Well, women aren't willing to take risks. They, they're not particularly keen on stepping forward for leadership. Have we heard that before? Yeah? So here's the thing. Actually, if you look at it from a neuroscience perspective, behavioral perspectives, women have no problems taking risks, but where they do have a problem is with ambiguity. It's actually understanding where and how decisions are made. Even more importantly, women will take leadership where there's a very clear sense of purpose. And we have found this through our research, we found this through the programs we run. When women understand that what their, what their end game is, what that purpose is for. The leadership is a byproduct. It's not a means in itself, but that becomes the motivation for actually developing their leadership because they know what their sense of purpose is. And that can be for their own career path. It often is about changing something within their organization, changing something with their teams. But it's been very, very clear what that is in order to build leadership. You, you, I think it is changing, but still, you will find women who are not necessarily saying, I'm achieving, I'm going to take, push myself just for the sake of that next leadership promotion. Of course it's there, but there's still an element of whether or not they're willing to say that out loud. 
But that sense of purpose, it has been proven that that is something that really speaks to why women step into leadership roles. A lot of times, companies will say, do you know what, we really cater well for women. We have a women's network program. Uh, we've got a strong sponsorship program. This is working really, really well. Yes? A couple of smiles there again. And then when you start to dig a bit deeper and you say, okay, tell me what, how are you measuring success with the networking program? Okay, well, we run five really successful events a year. International Women's Day, we do an event and we have a senior leader come in and he'll talk to the women about what it needs for them to be a successful woman in the organization. Yeah? So actually, here's the thing. What's the point of building these networks? The point about building networks, it's about exposure to different people. It's about actually having vertical interactions so senior leaders are meeting women and spotting talent. We also often get told, oh, we've got a really great sponsorship program. Now, interestingly, a few years ago, some research in Harvard Business Review showed that sponsorship, despite being developed as a mechanism to support women, was overused by men. And women were still being over-mentored under-sponsored, over-mentored. And again, you will know, mentoring is people talking to you, sponsorship is people talking about you, but if you haven't got enough people talking about you, you're not getting anywhere. And we looked at that and really tried to understand what was going on there and said, okay, if sponsorship isn't working, what's the alternative? And I mentioned to you this big global pieces of research we've been working on. So one of the things we did, we had the most amazing opportunity to interview senior female leaders from a, from a range of these 53 countries and from every possible sector you can imagine. Former politicians, CEOs of financial companies, uh, chief execs from public sector organizations or directors of public sector organizations, uh, social enterprises. It was completely, completely diverse. So it wasn't just the tech sector or finance, it was everything. And when you're speaking, for example, to women who had started off, who'd, who'd been born in a village in Botswana and went on to become the CEO of the largest life insurance company for Botswana, or the first, first female prime minister of New Zealand, or the, the CEO of the largest social enterprise in, um, in Australia. Very, very different backgrounds, very, very different opportunities afforded to them. But here was the thing that each one of them shared. There were two things consistently these women shared. They had all had a champion. And they defined the champion. They shaped this for us. And he, this champion was very different to a sponsor. And they also had, a, they had stretch opportunities very, very early on when they moved into a new organization. Not early in their careers, but early when they moved into a new organization. And that's really important. So for them, a champion, different to a sponsor because the onus was on senior leaders to find that female talent and spot it and recognize that there are reasons why women can be a little bit more hesitant about why they put themselves forward. Sometimes women don't even see their strengths before somebody else sees it. But when the onus is on a champion or a senior leader to spot that talent, the dynamic shifts. It's not about a woman saying to a senior leader, please, will you sponsor me? and in return I can do X, Y, and Z, which, let's face it, a little bit transactional and a little bit uncomfortable for, us, for a lot of us. And we actually spoke to a lot of senior leaders who said, I do champion, and I do it for one reason, it's the right thing to do. I need to find the best talent for my organization, and I want to be seen as a leader who pulls that talent through. So championing really started to fall into place and because of the range of companies, countries, sorry, we'd spoken to, it fits whether you're talking to a woman in Malaysia, a woman in Canada, a woman in the UK, a woman in South Africa. It, it's culturally far more acceptable to have that championing relationship. How many times have we heard this? It's a waste of time investing in women. They leave. They go off, they have babies, or something else goes on, or X, Y, and Z. It's just, it's a wasted resource. Now I get, it's perhaps not politically correct to say these things, right? But it's certainly something we still hear a lot of and a lot worse. And yet here's the thing, how many times when you speak to women 
Let, let's just take the common scenario, maternity leave, right? Women come back after maternity leave. How many times do you hear somebody saying, well, they've just had a baby, let's give them something nice and easy to allow them to get their feet back under the table? And how many times, what do the women turn around and say to us? I don't want something nice and easy. It has taken me so much to organize childcare, to leave my family, to get this all sorted out. And you know, in this country, organizing childcare is not cheap and it's not easy. So if you've gone through all that pain, you really don't want something that's gonna be safe. You want to be valued for what you can bring to your organization the same way you were doing it before the baby came along. Now here's the other really interesting fact. When we start to bust myths, the assumption is when women leave an organization, they leave to, because they're just going to stay at home. They want an easier life. The rate of startups in this country amongst women is far higher than it's ever been. So when women leave, they do one of two things, more often than not. They will either walk straight into the doors of a competitor or they will set up their own business. And in many cases, those businesses will compete with the companies they were working for. So let's not fool ourselves that women are looking for an easier option. Now, I know, I know a lot of you know this, but I'm pulling it together because here's the thing, sometimes we forget what that big picture looks like because we're so caught up in our organizations and what's going on. And we need to be armed with this. And it was all of this information we used when we started to think about creating a leadership program for women. And I have to tell you, this program's probably been six, seven years in the making. And unfortunately, my colleague Claire can't be with me today, but we've been um, plotting this and actually saying, how do we, two things, how do we help organizations ensure that if they put women through this program, they don't lose the women? Because again, we've, we've often seen that problem. You put women onto amazingly fantastic programs, and then the women can't see a way up for them, so what do they do? They walk out. That doesn't work. We want those organizations to keep the women. But at the same time, we also want to make sure that the women are equipped to ask the difficult questions and to actually navigate their way. So we have a program. I'm not going to go through it in too much detail, but suffice to tell you, all of the things that we have talked about, the pieces about building leadership becoming really important. But at the same time, and this is where I think this is, this is really unique with what we have, the championing piece is completely unique to what Henley offers. But the second thing, and this is what I'm really excited about, this is a co-created program. So the women actually sit down with us, and first of all, we, know, we spend time with them at the beginning to understand what their needs are. But you can see by module five, which is right at the end, they have created that, that day with us. So it is not an off-the-shelf program, it is customized for each cohort. And it also allows them to find ways to stretch themselves and ensure that they are delivering their impact, because one of the core things of this program, women are coming in with a change agenda. Remember I said at the beginning that sense of purpose? Women are actually coming in with a change agenda, which they will develop alongside a champion over the course of the program. And we can talk about this with you in more detail at the end of the session. So we had a chance to deliver a similar program towards the end of last year, and that was very much focused at women in tech. And I just wanted to share with you some of the feedback we had from the women. But the other thing I just wanted to share with you before we finish, and we've got a few minutes, this is important because 2019 is shaping up to be a really big year in the gender diversity space. So two months time, gender pay gap reporting, will the dead, we hit the deadline. How many of your organizations have already started um, submitting their details? Okay. Predictions are gender pay gap reporting will be worse than last year. We're already hearing that anecdotally from organizations we're working with. It's something we expect to see because last year, the launch, it was all out there. This year, what we have seen, organizations haven't got their heads around what they need to do as quickly in order to report. Now, okay, that's what it is, right? But here's the thing. In addition to the reporting, what story are your organization sharing to say, the results are as they are, but here's what we're doing to make things better. And here's the thing. We don't like talking about money still. It's really hard, especially in this country, this culture, very, very difficult to talk about this. One of the women who was at our leadership program turned around and she, um, she actually shared this anecdote. She moved, she was actually headhunted for a job 
Um, and part of the momentum was the gender pay gap. Uh, the, you know, there's a lot of movement around that time. And she turned around and she said, when she spoke to the headhunter, she realized that she was being paid 70, 70% less than her colleagues. 70% less than her colleagues. She had no idea until the headhunter started preparing her for another role and they were in the package negotiation piece. So those conversations are so, so important. And it's really interesting. We tell women, you need to ask. We tell men, be willing to talk. And yet it's still one of the most difficult conversations to have. So that's something we work on with the women. Evidence-based progress. I've mentioned this. I'm not going to go into it in too much detail again. But everything we do needs to be measured. It's not just about ensuring that we've got women at certain levels, but the initiatives, the interventions, the programs that are being run, we need to know what difference they make. Because when you're speaking to colleagues, when you're accountable for the budgets and resources, you need to be able to demonstrate what those resources show. And I'm really, really pleased to see that there is a much stronger focus in the gender piece around data collection and evidence. And then, of course, some of you are already dealing with this, the reputational risks of organizations aligned with the retention of female talent. If you are a company that says, okay, we haven't quite got the gender pay gap right, and let's face it, a lot don't, but here's what we're doing, and we're on a learning curve, and we're trying really hard to retain our female talent and promote it, and not alienate our male talent, there is still a lot of goodwill around there. And our job is to work with organizations to help them promote their women, and at the same time, build a more inclusive culture. And again, I just wanted to finish with one more quote from one of the women on the program because she was, she was so empowered on the day we, we are finished with them and she said, look, the learning, it doesn't stop here. I'm going to take my learning back. But she also, her sense of purpose became really clear by the end of the program. She said, I'm going to make STEM cool for women. And this is someone who'd been working in the space for a very long time. So I've rattled through this. I just wanted to see if there were any questions before we finish. Okay, so I think we're done. Thank you very much for listening to me. Myself, my colleagues are here, so if you'd like to speak to any of us, please come and grab us. Otherwise, we'll see you on H um, H65.